collapsing. Thank you. You know, someday. What? Someday. We'll have somebody do that all for us. Collapsing. All the all the pushing the cord and somebody to stand behind the camera. And I don't know if I want anyone to stand behind the camera or fucking rambling on about a bunch of nonsense. No, we need we need the uh, we need the producer so that, and we have some sort of a back channel in our ear. You know, uh, get an IFB. Sure. So that you that's what that's called is an IFB. Ah, infrared butthole. Uh, no, I actually don't know what it stands for. <laughs> oh. Um. God, what would that stand for? I don't know. It's like your whole. I need to. I need to. Add, I know, right? Well, it says I don't need to know the acronyms for it. I know it's an IFB, and I know that that's what they put in their ear to listen. I work in TV, so I don't know why anyone anyone that regularly listens to this podcast should know that. Yeah, but gets mentioned often. I don't want to assume. I'm not. I'm you know, not here to make somebody an ass. If somebody might be like, "Hey, I missed all of 2023. What happened?" Well, that, <laughs> they came to the perfect podcast for that, because on this, the Lord's 57th episode of the Duels and Man of Dorks podcast, I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And of course, the Duels and Man of Dorks podcast, a D&D and MTG podcast where we talk about Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, and all the things. Usually we go over a lot of news, uh, but because it's the holidays and the new year, there really isn't any news. Kind of thankfully. Yeah, yeah. Could we have batched this out sooner and just like banked it for later and enjoyed this Monday, uh, January 2nd off? Or Tuesday, January 2nd off? Probably. But Could have, but... Yeah, fuck it. I don't care. Um, we live dangerously. We do like to live dangerously. I, 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 would like to, I would like to be in a future scenario where it's like, okay, it's like mid-December and we're just fucking going ham and batching out all this content and then scheduling it to post and then just getting like three weeks off. That'd be cool. That'd be dope. But that also requires this being a full time job, which it's not. Not yet. I think I do think we should do a state of a state of the dungeon. State of the dungeon? State of the dungeon. State of the bros. State of the bros. Yeah. Cause I we we came we came to a realization yesterday. Yeah, we we had a little strategy meeting. Yeah, we yeah, we did a we did like a reassess kind of thing like, oh, we've dropped the ball. <laughs> Just kind of generally with our content. It's been a depressive year, but... Things are gonna, uh, starting to look up. Things are looking up. We're excited for, for the future of the podcast. The rebrand, I think, revitalized us a little bit. We've got the setup so that it's like very easy to do. Yeah. It's a very low-friction environment now. We also got on the same page. Yes, yes. And we've made more money than I think we realized. Yeah. Like, we have a... we Like, we're not making, like, income money, but we're, like... We're making enough that we can like buy things. Yeah, and, I mean, we bought we bought plenty of things for this setup, clearly. But like, we're gonna be able to like invest in some in some shit. Yes, which is pretty cool. And that's all thanks to this week's sponsor, Christopher Penis and Cynthia Wilshiroon Watsi's new product from Wizards of the Coast, Baldur's Gate 3.2, the episodic D and D adventure. Every turn in combat can be had for a very cheap, low price of one ninety nine. Every single combat in Baldur's Gate three point two, a dollar ninety nine. And don't forget the level up expansion for nineteen ninety five a month, where every month you give them twenty dollars and they'll let you level up in the game. Thank you very much to Christopher Penis and Cynthia Wilshiru and Watsi for the newest Baldur's Gate expansion, Baldur's Gate three point two, a fragmentary passage. That's a Kingdom Hearts reference. Ah. 3.2 final chapter prologue fragmentary passage days over two. That's a that's a deep that's that's many Kingdom Hearts references in one. That's I the bit the okay. meme the meme being of course that they named their games in a very silly and nonsensical way in yes. a lot of in a lot of regards because obviously there's Kingdom Hearts one two and three sure and then there's like Birth by Sleep and Recoded and. Um, three five eight days over two. Yes, that's how it's pronounced. Okay, it's three five eight, di- like divided by like a fraction. Yeah. two. Okay, and then days in the logo is what it looks like, but it's pronounced three five eight days over two because the whole point is it's basically a year and it's between two characters in the game. Ah, yeah, okay. it's a dumb name. Yeah, it's a bad name. I didn't know it was pronounced that until I saw a television spot for it once. Oh, yeah. That's uh, very complicated. Yeah, but this is not a Kingdom Hearts podcast. As much as I would love as it, as much to as be. you would love it, <laughs> I would fucking love it to be a Kingdom Hearts podcast. But no, maybe when we have our full uh, a full production studio, you can bring somebody else in just to talk uh, that that'd kind be of shit oh, with you. That'd be fun. I would love. I would love to do like a like a like a live stream. Just 
fucking riffing for an hour about Kingdom Hearts. I could do I could do a fucking four hour lore lore recap of the entire series and there's a there's a three hour like like uh lore recap for Kingdom Hearts where like the whole idea is like one guy is the professor like at the front of the class and then giving a lesson on it and like a bunch of his friends are just giving him shit and I'm like it's like 80% of the way there but he misses out on some fucking key details that I would not allow in my recap. Dude. That's neither here nor there. I suppose. I don't think I don't think the audience wants that. But the real sponsor, because that was our joke sponsor, obviously. Thank you to Christopher Penis and Cynthia Wilshire Ruin Watsi. That's a that's a reference to Chris Cox, the CEO of Hasbro, we'll and then also about. Cynthia Williams, the CEO and president of Wizards of the Coast. Which, if you're unaware, we'll talk about that in just a minute, actually. Yeah, yeah. But our actual our actual sponsor, we want to shout out uh, in the TikTok shop. You're going to see a lot of products from Proxy Forge. Tyler over at the Proxy Forge, uh, he makes really great MTG proxies. He's got a lot of cool packs. He's just got restock of the Edgar Markov Vampire packs. Got a restock of the Lord of Wraiths, which is the Lord of the Nazgul, and then nine unique. Nazgul Arts. Uh, you can go and check out his proxies there in the TikTok shop. You can also go to his website, www.theproxyforge.com. If in the notes section when you're checking out, you put Dungeon Bros, he's going to include a free artist collab soul ring from the artist Map Map. That's M A H P M A H P. Uh, and Sam has that in his deck. And it looks fucking great. Pretty cool. It is very cool. He has a whole artist collab series on his website. You can check out. There's a lot wider. There's a wider array of products available on his website as opposed to the TikTok shop. But if you use the TikTok shop, particularly stuff in the live stream, we record the podcast every other week live on TikTok. By the way, uh, if you use the TikTok shop or our TikTok sh- showcase uh, on our TikTok page, we get a commission for it, which helps out the show. Hell yeah. Sam, what have you been playing? Uh, so recently I picked up Alan Wake 2. I've heard good things. I've heard good things. It is, it is, so the Alan Wake 1 was, I believe, a release title for the PS4. Mm-hmm. And so, th- you know, what, 13 years later, the, uh, the second one comes out. And I will say they did a lot of, uh, they did a lot of, um, good things with it. They, the 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 gameplay is good for a horror game. The uh, the storyline, I will say, they also have in universe another game which I love, which is Control. Um, and so a lot of the references that come from that are in Alan Wake Two are from Control. Yeah. And I can see that if you didn't play that game, you might be a little even more um, uh, mystified or might be missing some of the plot. But that being said, the game is very cinematic. It's very weird. It's uh, and it's it's a neat extension to the series. So I'm enjoying that. Yeah, you were a lot. you were all up in Control's asshole for a while. You were all up. You were all up in them guts. All up in them guts. All up in them control guts. And I didn't pay anything for that game. It was yeah. free. It was a free game with gold <laughs> or a free true. game with PS Plus. That's true. Uh, you haven't gotten anything new in the D and D and MTG realm to talk about. You were very proud of your your character that you made. I was last, last week. Time. Last time. No, I haven't that played in D and D since. Um, I mean, I, we've been adding uh, some some proxies to our certain decks. Um, I added O'Hare Talk to uh, mm. my Cadric Cadric Soul Kindler deck. Yeah, that's uh, fucked up, man. Which we played that's last fu- night. That's a fucked up thing to do to someone. And it was it was. Really fun. <laughs> but that's the that's the most not not too much new going on in the nice. world. Nice. Uh, I am I am waiting diligently waiting for the Persona Three Reloaded mm. uh, Persona Three Reload in February. To come out, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be all up in them guts, all up in them, all up. Ooh, I was about to say something awful about <laughs> about because they're all anime high school things. Yeah, that's gonna, I'm not that'd gonna, be really weird. We're not gonna do that. Uh, but I finally put together uh, my Lord of the Nazgul deck that I've been wanting to do since Tales of Middle Earth came out. And uh, shout out to Tyler at the Proxy Forge. He didn't send me this pack, the the Lord of the Wraiths pack. I bought the pack, but. Um, it's nice to have a fancy Lord of the Nazgul and then be able to keep all of my Nazgul cards in my collection binder for the Lord of the Rings set and then have uh, proxies to play with. And I souped it up with a couple other proxies and then a whole lot of Lord of the Rings cards. And it plays very, it plays very well. It plays yeah. exactly how I wanted it to. And I love it. <laughs> Good. I love we'll, it. We'll have to, we were playing, we're going to, well, the SCG Con this yes. weekend. So yes. hopefully S- get some reps with it. Yes. SCG Con Cincinnati yeah. this, this weekend, January, what? Fifth to seventh, we're gonna be there. I don't know if we're gonna be there all three days. We're definitely gonna be there probably Saturday and Sunday Saturday. for a while. Uh, our friend, our friend, uh, friend of the show, um, 
Oh my God, Brandon Vol. There we go. Friend of the show, Brandon Vol is going to be there. Personal friend of ours. We're going to hang out. We're going to be jamming a lot of Commander, doing some Oathbreaker probably. We're very excited for the Two-Headed Giant Commander event. Yeah, we did that last time. And that was a lot of fun. Yes, uh, I'm going to be souping up my Feather the Redeemed deck with only real cards just because it's a it's a sanctioned event. Technically, they don't give a fuck if you're playing proxies, but I just want to be legit with it. Yeah. Uh, and we're probably going to do the combo of Feather the Redeemed and Ivy Glethal Spell Thief. Yeah. Because <laughs> that combo fucks. <laughs> real well it fucks great um before we get into the rundown and the and the recap of 2023 there is one news item that we do want to address uh over at the commander Her- commanders herald.com uh josh nelson got an exclusive interview with one of the uh former wizards of the coast employees that was uh laid off recently in the the massive swath of layoffs at Wizards of the Coast. We talked a lot about that last week, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, was one of our best performing podcasts of all time last week. We really appreciate that. But um, he got an interview. It was an anonymous interview. And some of the stuff is a little bit um, just kind of confirming what we originally thought. But there is some interesting little bits that we want to get in here. Uh, he, He asked this person, was the layoff something that came out of nowhere? The response was, yes and no. While there was communication that numbers were not where they needed to be, all conversations pointed this being due to the toys division of Hasbro and that changes would be taking place on that end. We had several town hall Q&As with HR, Human Resources, uh, Cynthia Williams, who is the president and CEO of Wizards of the Coast, and Chris Cox, who is the CEO of Hasbro, where this was brought up. In the one with Cynthia, she responded to HR's comment of, quote, we are killing it by correcting her, saying we are actually not. She then called out someone in the back of the group saying, quote, I believe Wizards numbers are lower than last year, to which the person she was speaking to said they were actually up. She then tried to explain this as Wizards not hitting the numbers needed, what was promised to stockholders, and if not for Baldur's Gate 3, the company would be in trouble. When this was brought up in the Chris Cox town hall, he commented about it being more towards the toy division and changes would be made. Um... I want to I want to I want to pause here for a moment because yeah. that is enlightening very much and it's it gets back to exactly what we were saying last week about clearly there wasn't a there's a disconnect in what the reality is and what the perception is on on the executive level. Mm-hmm. There there's a lack of um uh transparency and even in the company itself is kind of shocking um just Chris Cox originally was the in charge of Wizards and then mm-hmm. got moved up to um and then got moved up to the t- in the entirety of Hasbro. So, you know, is this him him going, "Oh, this is my, you know, this was my former division. Maybe I have some loyalties here or whatever in his own head." Uh but then Cynthia Williams just arguing with everybody it seems. That- we're killing it. No, we're not. We're down, right? You over there, we're down. Now we're up. Uh, well, it's because of Baldur's Gate 3. It, it, Chris Cox has the view of the entire company, and he's the one that has admitted publicly multiple times that Wizards is profitable, Yeah, and it's the toy division that isn't. And to have Cynthia Williams at the top of Wizards of the Coast being so abjectly negative about Wizards, being like, yeah, our numbers are down. No, our numbers are up. Well, they're not up enough. It's like, well... That's on you to create more realistic projections for your stockholders. Mm -hmm. And also the the chart that has been flowing around Twitter yet again of like the number of releases every quarter for Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And it's like kind of flatline, if not like a small steady increase. And then you get to like 2019 and it fucking balloons straight. It's like a classic hockey stick chart, you know, and it just goes straight up and out of nowhere. Cynthia Williams being that combative... I find somewhat it, uh, disturbing and also interesting and very much makes sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you, you joked about it in the joke sponsor, but we kind of talked about this previously uh, earlier in the year when she pretty much clearly stated, we don't want things like D and D to be a seasonal buying experience. We want mm-hmm. it to be a regular spending environment yes. or a, con- a continuous spending environment. And I and you got to wonder if that's what she's been trying to sell to the stakeholders as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the other questions that I want to touch on 
they asked about severance if it was reasonable and they said it was slightly below what it was in the average but on the lower end for mm-hmm. most company severances were there internal fault lines both within Wizards of the Coast and within Hasbro in general? Is there any generational divide, for instance? The response was, the employees within Wizards all meshed really well. We had to. Teams were so short-staffed and begging for headcount before the layoffs that you didn't have a chance to clash about anything. Uh, then they asked if tar- if layoffs were targeting to upper, middle, or lower class employees. And they said it was across the board. The only exceptions were the execs who needed to be held accountable at the most. Uh, they asked about faith in Hasbro. I don't think that's really necessarily pertinent. Um, and then how much exposure to the details of Wizards of the Coast branded items does the standard Hasbro employee have? And do you see or hear anything like book names or packaging before it's announced? And their answer was, it depends on what products you are working on slash with. If you have to have insight to build campaigns and marketing, but insight was all there was. Again, feedback concerns and anything else brought up was dismissed. Uh, and the last thing before I before I toss it over to you, Sam, uh, we brought up the Alta Fox attempt to separate Wizards from the Coast from Hasbro in 2022, and they asked about the internal reception from that. And they said it was hard to hear anything about the Alta Fox attempt uh, with so much quote becoming one with Hasbro is going to be wonderful being shouted at us. However, employees were wary and had concerns. Nothing I recall being addressed. Just a lot of quote leadership will have to discuss that and get back to you. And some more, some more things about the Magic Arena's economy that doesn't really apply to us, um, and then some resources to help employees that were laid off. But I mean, we were we were talking about Alta Fox a while ago. Oh yeah, Yay us, yeah, Hitt- hitting that on the hard. Well done. But it was it was it was more rumors back then because we didn't have the hard facts. But I think the more information that comes out, the more it's showing that it's just yeah, it's the 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 ship is being. <laughs> is being sunk, but it's because the anchor is dropped and that anchor is like all of Hasbro and the shit and wizards is the one thing keeping the ship going. I don't know. Do you have anything you want to say? You know, we looked it up and uh, <clears throat> Hasbro acquired wizards back in 1999 for $325 million. Fucking steal. So that's fucking steal based on the fact that magic became their first billion dollar IP. Mm-hmm. And now the fact that they're just, I don't know what it is if, but like you think by 2023, there's been so much openness with how successful businesses run Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't necessarily be trying to just, it feels like they're trying to madman it, you know? Yeah. Trying to, trying to force it into an old perspective and maybe they are. I, it's, it's a mix of old old thinking of how to monetize things like who why why would they make a fucking cable television channel and make shows yeah that's such old head thinking but then mixed with oh well let's just jump into the subscription model mm-hmm. of of selling D&D product it it's a weird mix and it it's all just nonsensical for the platform. Um, and that's that's all I want to talk about that for now until we get to that point in the recap All right, tonight. Uh, of course, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, you can get that podcast every other week. We record it live on TikTok on Tuesdays. Uh, you can get the podcast the next day on Wednesdays at 1230 on Apple Podcasts, Google Spot- Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Music, as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have our TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord, our Monday Night Magic live streams on TikTok. We got the deck lists that we need to update on Moxville yeah, as we well. Do. We need to really update those because those are way, way past. <laughs> way past. Yeah, and cool. we'll go through the upcoming releases. Sam, what are the upcoming releases for D&D and Magic the Gathering? All right. So for D&D, we have the Book of Many Things. The digital has been out for several months now, but the physical is finally coming out, uh, if you're listening live, in two days on January 4th of this year. Uh, we have Vecna Eyes, Eve of Ruin, that's also coming out this year, and The Quest from the Infinite Staircase, which is the anthology book that will be coming out. Yes, that's that's probably going to be the one product that's worth getting <laughs> yes. for, for D&D. Uh, of course, we also have the uh, future uh, release of the new revised edition of 5th edition Still coming out sometime this year. Sometime this year. Apparently, in like 
Q2, Q1 range. So spring, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, moving on to Magic the Gathering. We, a little over a week on January 12th, we have Ravnica Remastered coming out. I, I love a remastered set. Love a remastered. We're probably gonna we're probably gonna be going hard on the remastered set for the Monday Night Magics. There's gonna be some real good reprints in there. Oh yeah. Uh, then we have Murder at Karlov Manor coming out on February 9th. My birthday. Your birthday. Uh, March 8th will be the Fallout decks from the Universes Beyond. Q2 has both Outlaws, a Thunder Junction, and the Modern Horizons 3, as well as Assassin's Creed coming out in July. Univer- uh, then Bloomboro will be in Q3 and Duskmorn in Q4, mm. which we can also probably expect some others to pop up throughout the year, as we have seen in this past year, 2023. Yeah, I mean, you look at that you look at that magic release schedule, and it's like Q1 and Q2 are jam-packed with a bunch of stuff, and it's like, oh, here's just some, here's just like two things for the last end of the year. I'm just like, that's, no, <laughs> that's not that's happening. not how that works. <laughs> that's not at all how that works. Uh, yeah, I'm personally. <sighs> Murder at Karlov Manor, I'm sure, will be neat. Outlaws of Thunder Junction will be neat. So those story-based sets, Mm kind of like Brothers War, aren't really my jam. That's fair. Uh, I like more of the the plain thing. Like, the Wilds of Eldraine is cool. Lost Caverns of Ixalan is cool. Like, there's stories there, but it's like, here's just a plain. Yeah. Like, the Ravnica block, which is why. I mean, Ravnica is going to have great. I'm excited (laughs) about about Ravnica Remastered. So, Sam? Sam Sam did the recap for 2023. We're going through all of the big... I assume releases, the big talking points of everything. Uh, I have not looked at any of this because I wanted to take a week off because I'm a lazy (laughs) piece of shit. (laughs) Fair enough. So, yeah, we're going to hit D&D. We're going to go through all the releases. We'll cut. We haven't we didn't do too much with D&D this year in uh, reference to the actual printed books. Yeah. I mean, there hasn't really been. Ever since they announced one D and D, I there really hasn't been a compelling. Re- they haven't released a compelling D and D product to warrant purchasing it before one D and D. Obviously, we love the anthology style books, yeah. and those are useful. But we haven't been playing as much D and D, and I think we're just kind of a lot of people are just in holding patterns with D and D based on like the behavior of Wizards of the Coast, the behavior like the OGL at the beginning of the year, and then um, just waiting for one D and D at this point. Yeah, um, and so we'll go through each of those, and then we'll hit uh, one D&D, mm-hmm. all the playtests have been out, Magic the Gathering, and then all of the news, the big news items throughout from throughout the year. Oh, for fuck's sake. That's going to that's gonna be a... All right. So as you mentioned, uh, early in the year, a lot of things kind of got overlooked, um, and one of those things, I think, was Keys from the Golden Vault, which released mm. in February of last year, which was the anthology book featuring heists. Yes, yes. Um, big one from that, but it was kind of overlooked due to the OGL thing. In fact, we even forgot it came out. Oh my god, yeah. Key, I've, Keys from the Golden Vaults feels like something that came out in like 2021. Yeah. like It feels like it, it was something that came out like in the thick of the pandemic, and it's like, oh no, that's when we had like fucking, what, Plane Chase? Yeah, <laughs> Plane Chase. Or Planescape. Planescape came yes. out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh god. That would, no, 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 no. The, spell jammers. Spell jammers. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Duh, yes. Duh, duh, duh. I'm, right I'm, before, yes. Or late, late oh. in 2022, we had spell jammers, God which was sake. racked in controversy. I'm, and the book is fine, my, and, but like, no, but it, it, the books were, the books were fine for the most part. They were just really thin and just not with a lot. And it was like a box set and it was, it immediately went so cheap. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? Same thing happened with uh, the, the, uh, Dragon plane. Oh my God! Yes, um, uh, Dragon Lance. Dragon Lance. That also came out the end of 2022. But again, no one cared. That was that was one of the that was a big missed opportunity with Dragon Lance. Again, that's 2022. Yeah. This is a 2023. Keys from the Golden Vault. As far as anthology go, th- anthologies go, uh, 13 heist themes adventures ranging from levels one to 11. That's the kind of shit that like if you're gonna if you're gonna make like a regular product that you release anthology books, I think are the way to go. And I think theming it like this has mm-hmm. been a great idea. I agree. Uh, then we skip a forward a couple months, actually, to August 15th, when we had a double release. One announced, which was Bigby Presents the Glory of Giants, and then uh, just kind of dropped on us the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons. Mm. So Bigby's, of course, was a uh, giant, a lore book based around giants, that included some character options, some DM tools, um, and had a a little bit of an AI art controversy. Probably the kind of the first one we saw the year, actually. Yeah. Um, also, there's currently like a big controversy going on with Mid Journey AI. 
Oh, yeah? It's a, that's like the most popular image-based AI thing where apparently there was a leaked internal list of like all the artists they were like actively trying to mimic the style of. Oh. And was using as like seating and were trying to talk their way out of crediting and also paying said artists. Mm. It's not really D&D and magic, so we're not going to talk about it, but I think there were some magic artists and D&D artists in that list of people that were having their art stolen. That makes sense. Yeah. But overall, these two, I think we were pretty low on. Yeah. um, Bigby Presents Glory of the Giants didn't review super well. No. It's not a subject matter that... Like, giants, of course, are important, but it's not a subject matter where there's enough... There's not enough meat on that bone Mm -hmm. to make a proper supplement out of. It would be great as part of a giant uh, plane. Like a plane where giants are like a, a core part of that plane's existence kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and then the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons was just kind of like, it It was free. It was a little intro adventure and it had lore. Or and it, the Peril and Pinebrook was like the free one and kind of tied in with, sure, I guess. It didn't have, the, the, the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons didn't have, it was just lore. It was, it was an illustrated book. Mm-hmm. Um, Cool if you want to just read a book about dragons, I guess. I guess, but, but as far as a D and D supplement, and like they they have been hammering dragons a lot with um, Fizzbin's guy, mm-hmm. the Fizzban book, and then Dragonlance. Like we had plenty of dragon lore and info and new stat blocks and fun things, which is kind of interesting that they even decided to take time and do any of that. We move forward to uh, uh, September 19th when Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk came out, which is a full campaign book based on the original 5e starter adventure. Um, and it kind of touched on a bunch of the obelisks that we saw throughout other D&D adventures since 2014. Mm-hmm. That This was the one that I was excited for. Uh, and then it came out and it's like, oh, it didn't really it didn't really culminate in anything. Yeah. You know, it was kind of it was kind of like. I mean, we'll get into magic later, but like all the Phyrexian invasion, and it's like, oh, it happened. Okay, done. Yeah, a lot of a lot of just dropped storyline, basically. Mm-hmm. And like they made a point. Like people have been talking for, I mean, the better part of a decade at this point about all of the random obelisks, and mm-hmm. like they're like one of them having a Nalfishne in it if you like interact with it a whole bunch, and then it's completely detached from the entire rest of the adventure, and it doesn't like there's nothing else there. Yeah, and it's like it, it, clearly they're all hinting at something big, and it's clear that they wanted to do something big, but for whatever reason they didn't or weren't able to. Yeah, and it's just kind of confusing, and especially and building on that Fandelver name, which is of course a, a notable starting adventure that mm-hmm. many people start with. It's it also you know with most uh, campaigns, people often complain about the bosses and the monsters in yeah. there. So, yeah. well. Fan over and below, we wish we knew you. Uh, but moving on to October 17th, the day after my birthday, mm. uh, we got Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse, which was a complete campaign guide including a setting book called Sigils in the Outland, an adventure book, Turn the Fortune's Wheel, and a bestiary, Mort's Planar Parade. So this one, from what I heard, was doing quite well, oh, yeah? actually. Uh, just because... like. Th- the idea of all these different planes kind of mashing together mm-hmm. and um, there's a there was a bit in the promotion for Planescape where they had Brendan Lee Mulligan and they were talking about like uh, Celestia mm. and he was like he loved the idea of like this this city that is like on the border of the the the, the, the like primary outer planes that are lawful good um, or like and to stop from ascending to that plane, they like once a year like go up to the the mayor's like, all right, well everybody has to line up and you gotta punch me in the face real hard. You can't hold back. We can't if we're too law if we're too lawful good, they're just gonna suck us up into the into Celestia and we we can't do that. So I need every one of you to line up very orderly and just like punch me in the face as hard as you can. And that's how they stop themselves from ascending yeah. to <laughs> Celestia and like that kind of stuff. And there's a whole lot of interesting things there, but by the time we get into the fall and with the upcoming releases and with one D and D play tests on the horizon and just all the controversy, it just seems like these books aren't doing very well. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, we often get into talk about 
uh, fatigue uh, or product fatigue, mm-hmm. which we had a thing come out two weeks later, which is the book of many things. Uh, the digital it digitally dropped on October thirty first and was supposed to drop uh, physically two weeks later, but there were some issues in uh, printing. And they were not happy, and Wizards was not happy with the physical product, Mm -hmm. so they delayed it, delayed it, delayed it until January 4th of this year. Um, But it was a DM's guide that expanded upon the chaos inducing magic item, the deck of many things. It included several magic items, traps, locations, and a few new character options. Um, We've, you know, this has kind of dropped around the time that in the past we've gotten Xanathars and we've gotten um, Tasha's. Except this wasn't that level yeah. of DM's guide. Yeah. The the of everything books. Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. The everything, quote yeah. unquote, supplements are clearly the most important ones. And there's the ones that people want the most. Um, and they were kind of trying to position the Book of Many Things in that way. And they were doing a lot of interesting things, like using the deck of many, like the actual physical deck yeah. of many things to like help randomize dungeons and yeah. randomize adventures and plot hooks. And they had a bunch of tables in there and it was a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, but between just the general community fatigue with D&D in the news and Watsi in the news and... The products just not really hitting what they need. And it feels like the the state of Dungeons and Dragons, particularly in the second half of 2023, was kind of in like a lame duck presidency vibe. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You know? Yeah. Like they, they're doing all these things, like they got things going on, but it doesn't really matter because it's not one D D. No. Which one might D&D. as well get into one D D. Yeah, one D D. Um they released play tests every couple weeks starting in the end of 2022 going flowing into 2023 um and uh after of course they would have a uh survey to kind of see how everybody thought about it um the first ones early one we saw in the year were the druid and paladin mm-hmm. uh and i will say they got their shit pushed in oh yeah um ev- no one was happy no they they very much neutered the power level of those two classes which i think Kind of needed to be ha- needed to happen because the druid and the paladin can run wild. Yes, in games, a, a druid can basically be a solo adventure on their own between being a oh, full yeah. spellcaster and with the full wild shape ability, be able to go out and be a bear. Yeah, and take down everything a bear can take down. Well, I'm, when when you're specific, it was specifically the circle of the moon druid mm-hmm. being able to at level two just get an ability where you're effectively quadrupling your hit point pool on command mm-hmm. and can do that twice a day yeah uh that ju- that gets out of hand very quickly especially because you can still concentrate on your spells while you're doing it so even though you can't cast spells in your animal form until higher levels um but it was th- a lot of people weren't very happy with how they chose to i think people were on on the whole were kind of okay with a little bit of a nerf to these classes but they weren't necessarily happy with the way they went about with Wild Shape. They were trying to change it to how the spells are giving you stat blocks yeah. for creatures that you summon, uh, just giving you stat blocks to choose from, and people wanted to be able to pick animals. Yeah. Uh, and they eventually went back to that later because they were doing revisions. Um, one thing I will say about just all the D&D playtests, they didn't do a very good job of communicating the whole... Um, We're just throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks, and then we're going to reel things back in. Because the early playtest, people were freaking the fuck out. Oh, yeah. And, like, they they said that in the long-form videos on D&D Beyond uh, with Chris Perkins, or not Chris Perkins, with... um, Uh, uh, Oh, my God. I'm forgetting some of the names. Biggest names. Um, I don't know why I have Mark uh, Rosewater in my head. I know that's (laughs) MTG. That... Whatever the fuck his name. Is. Yes, but they they do the break they would do the breakdowns of all the play tests and in those breakdowns like in the video they'd be like yes we know this is a little bit outlandish we're just kind of putting ideas out there and seeing how the community reacts and we're going to kind of we're going to settle into something that's a bit more familiar yeah. later on down the line and that communication was lost on a lot of people. Jeremy Crawford. Jeremy Crawford. Thank you. Chris Perkins is. Um, He's also a designer there, but he's not. He's he's squirt. <laughs> he's spurt. There spurt. we go. He's spurt. Uh, but yeah, so um, 
Next in the summer, uh, we got the biggest update yet. And that included five classes, the Barbarian, the Fighter, the Sorcerer, the Wizard, the Warlock, a bunch of spells, a bunch of rules. Uh, and I can't remember, but I think this might have been the first time we saw Weapon Masteries in the playtest. Yes. Yes, they had hinted at Weapon Masteries, and we got to see it for the very first time. Weapon Masteries, probably the best edition. I agree. That they've made. Like, right out of the gate, it was good, and the revisions that they've made since are very good. Uh, it gives the fighter uh, an identity. Yes. Which is very important. Uh, and then just most classes being able to have access to it in some way, it's go- it's going to make non-magical combat a lot more interesting. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, overall, I think this was probably the best, like, or the most accurate to from drop, or the most, I'm quite profitable, but the best for D&D drop at drop. Yeah, yeah. Um, With, I would also say that this supplement... This this homebrew or this uh this playtest was where you finally got one D and D to a point where you could feasibly and realistically start actually playing it at a table. Yes, with all the playtest material. Yeah, and we uh, we wanted to do that during Gen Con, but man, there just wasn't the time. <laughs> there was a lot of activity going on, and we got sucked up all up in the Ma- Magic the Gathering guts. We did, and so this is complete tangent. But don't if you're if you're trying to do everything you can. But also not die at Gen Con. Don't be forty minutes away. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be getting an Airbnb that's a lot closer this time. <laughs> we're gonna be sleeping on the show floor. Oh, probably not. Honestly, honestly, there's a couple of hotels that are like adjacent. That oh yeah, connected. I bet those blocks are probably already bought up. But well, uh, they're raffled off or they're lottered off. Oh, that's when you right. sign up, you get a lottery right. spot. Anyway, uh, late summer we got the monk. Mm. That was, I think, the best. Um, the best, like, immediately the changes to the monk were very good in my mm-hmm. mind. Um, they were still way too expensive with the, oh, God, they don't call it key points anymore. Spirit points. Spirit points, whatever. Um, again, why are we just why are we just changing things to be more inclusive and non-offensive when they're not offensive to begin with? That's what, I, that's what I'm curious about. But um, I think the monk... People were really wanting the monk because the monk needed a lot of help. The ranger earlier or last year needed yeah. a lot of help too, and they really did a number on the ranger. And they did a number on the monk, and people weren't necessarily happy with some of the things for the first iteration of the monk. But I think they it was clear that they were taking a stab at like actually like instead of like scalpeling some of these classes, they were like taking a fucking machete to the monk, and they were like, all right, we're gonna hack that off, and we're gonna put something else on. Yeah, yeah. The monk has always had a. a Never had a high the highest power ceiling. It's had a ha- very high floor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of people don't like that because it's not mm. as big and flashy as say the paladin. It didn't. It didn't have a big bomb. Uh, and then all monks kind of fell into the same pattern of taking a bunch of attacks, doing a bunch of stunning strikes, mm-hmm. and that was kind of it. Yeah. Which yeah. is powerful, but samey. Yes. Uh, then in the fall we got the warlock and the barbarian. Uh, got another take at them. Just some small updates, but inter- but more interestingly, we got uh, Bastions. Yes. The Bastion system. So you you were very familiar with the MCDM Strongholds and Followers yeah. book. And so you were able to really compare those two in a way that I haven't because I don't really look at a whole lot of MCDM <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but so what what's your perspective on that kind of comparison between uh, the Strongholds and Follower system versus Bastions? Strongholds and Followers is very much more its own game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still it's still obviously based on D and D, but if you're going to do Strongholds and Followers, you're gonna wanna you're you're gonna wanna play more of that almost political resource management or people management mm-hmm. game. Where yeah, you're still going on adventures probably, but it's it's to grow your own wealth and power as opposed to the Bastion system, which I think works a lot better for a typical D D campaign of just yeah. setting up oh i have a house go ahead i have a house i want to be cool with my house so i have a bat and then dm can be okay you have a bastion but yeah yeah um i liked the bastion system and it definitely was something that was they designed it smartly in that it's something that you can set up 
and then the DM can have running in the background while you go fuck off and do actual D&D adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one problem that I'm encountering with my work game right now is oh, yeah. we're going through a lot of like acquisition. He wants to do acquisitions incorporated stuff. Okay. Uh, which is fine. The acquisitions incorporated stuff is great. But what we've been interested in and what we've been working on and doing has been a lot of the um, – we want to go out and be like – Hunting the dragon cult, yeah, and doing the dragon cult stuff, and we've been, we feel like we've been getting stuck in water deep of like, oh well, here's your house, and here's your warehouse that can become your acquisitions incorporated headquarters, mm. and then you need, you're go, you're doing missions for acquisitions incorporated, and you're getting, uh, he added on like roles in acquisition incorporated, which give new abilities, and it's like, oh, that's cool, but it's not really what we signed up for, yeah. So there's kind of that conflict happening and it's something that we're trying to work through and talk about more um and we're gonna see how that goes into the new year because i think we're gonna be doing a little bit of a reset here Mm. in a little bit which i'm looking forward to but it compared to compared to all of that they clearly designed bastions from a sense of this is something that you can you can partake in more intimately if you so desire yeah but it's something that we're designing that you can just kind of set it forget it and go do D &D, and then just have like this home base yeah that you can go back to and in between. I think that's very helpful because, yeah, uh, the, the idea is cool. The idea of the strongholds or the the, uh, the uh, acquisition stuff is cool. But um, something ha- similar happened in actually both games I was running over the past three or four years where one group was like, oh, you know, I thought this group was like a little more of a, a political intrigue sort of idea. Mm-hmm. Now they just wanted to adopt pets and stab random people. And then same thing with uh, the campaign I was running for our group of friends, where it's like, yeah. oh, I should have been more clear that I that it was supposed to be centered around the strongholds and followers, but yeah, yeah. And we were we were doing we were doing that pretty well, but then I think what ultimate for one scheduling kind of scheduling, yeah, struggled with that. But I think we also fell into the habit, or we were getting into an adventure frame where our stronghold was being assaulted and kind of taken away because we hadn't been interacting with it in the way that we needed to. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was like a little bit on a, it was a little bit of on us for not interacting with that in a way. And then we just kind of were like, Oh, we're, we're like separated. We're being, we're being thrown in prison because of some of the decisions that we were, we were making and we were kind of falling victim to like this higher entity that we probably were sticking our noses in a little bit too deep into. Um, and then that's just kind of where it stopped. Yeah. Cause honest, cause honestly, like I had a plan, I had a bit of a plan for how mine and Darren's characters were going to be able to get out of that prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, beyond that, no fucking clue. <laughs> no idea what the fuck to do yeah. at that point. Um, okay. So that was the bastions. bastions. We were fans of bastions. We like bastions. Uh, and then the last one, uh, last D and D play test to come out of the year was uh, the monk and the druid revisited. Mm-hmm. I think that was the best one. Yes, they fixed a lot of. I don't want to say mistakes because obviously they were just kind of throwing things at the wall. Um, from what I've heard from our friends, mostly uh, is that those who really love druid still don't like the new druid. Yeah, I like the new druid because I never liked the original druid. I liked the original druid because it was powerful, mm-hmm. and now you have reason to like the druid. For being a druid and not because it's just very powerful. It's still powerful. Absolutely. All of the classes have been elevated. Mm -hmm. um, And the ones that were already really elevated are just kind of not being elevated more. Yeah. I think it really goes, speaks to their design um, aspect of we never want to make something that's the obvious or right choice for Mm -hmm. D&D. You always want to have the options. Yeah. Uh, I will say, just going back to the Warlock and the Barbarian real quick, the previous one. Yeah. Uh, The Warlock... It's in a great spot. <laughs> Real good spot. They were kind of fucking around with the spell slot mechanics mm-hmm. a bit, uh, which I fucked around with the spell slot mechanics a bit because I did. we did the whole, if you go over to our YouTube channel, the spell points video where yep. we swapped spell slots with the with the warlock for spell points instead and made it a short rest thing, kind of like a mana pool yeah. style. Uh, and I think that could work really well. But their system that they've, that they've changed for the warlock for spell slots, I think is going to be a much, much better system Yeah, than how it is now and how it was in the first play test by far. Um, and then the monk is finally like in a great spot. Yeah. They've, they adjusted a lot with the, with the monk's ability points and stuff like that. 
and how often you get it and things you can do. Certain things that required key slash spirit points now don't and you just get them yeah which i think is the way to go because i it, the big thing for me when looking at the monk versus like the rogue mm-hmm. was you had your step of the wind and patient mm-hmm. defense which cost a key point to use a bonus action to um dodge or disengage yes uh whereas you're the rogue you get cunning action at level two and you can just do those for free for free forever yeah. And now the monk just kind of does. And then if you spend spirit points on it, you get an additional effect yeah. on top of it, which I think is kind of, that's a good, a good spot. Yes. Real good spot. So uh, do you have anything else to say about 1D&D or D&D in general? I mean, overall, I I am curious to see what makes it into the final the final printing uh, mm-hmm. come this later this year. I, I, am, I am happy with a lot of the changes that they have made to... I want to say balance the game because this game will never be balanced, but to adjust it to make the play experience for everyone better. I I think they're doing a lot to give options to people to dive deeper into systems Mm -hmm. while also simplifying the play experience for the bottom like the the new players the bottom end of the of the player pool it's simplified uh while also having that depth for more veteran players which i think is really great i'm excited to see more on the dmg side yeah because other than the bastion system we haven't really seen anything from the dungeon master's guide perspective yeah it's been like the very first play test all a year and a half ago two years ago now of just rules of just rules and then yeah um uh, until yeah the bastion system i i because I feel like a lot of the a lot of the stuff in the original DMG was kind of glossed over by even mm-hmm. a lot of dungeon masters. Oh yeah, where like there's a lot of good juicy stuff in there that can really help you out if you dive into it, or if you do an optional rule, or you just it it lets you look at things from a bit of a different perspective that can help mm-hmm. run games quite a bit. So but now, well here look twenty D and D twenty twenty three. How do you feel about it? Good. <laughs> Bad. The the lame duck dungeon. The lame duck dungeon. The lame duck dungeon. I like that. That is our our twenty twenty three D and D year in view. The lame duck dungeon. The lame duck. D- <laughs> That's a great term. It's a great term. Let's get that on a shirt. <laughs> lame duck D and D. But yes. Uh, so segue. Magic the Gathering, the other half of Wizards of the Coast that we enjoy. Yeah. Arguably not at all lame duck. No. They they This is like a first term presidency. <laughs> like they're just doing all the fucking things they can. They keep getting reelected somehow. They, they really do. <laughs> it's like it's like uh it, like it's like Putin presidency style of just like, yeah, we'll have an election. Yeah, we're having an election. Yeah, absolutely. You run can. run against me, Lorcana. See what happens. <laughs> See what happens. Oh, oh, people are trampling you at Gen Con. That's a whole other We'll get, uh, yeah, the we'll, trample, the trample, the the, the, the waffle whole, stomp of yes. Lorcana cards. At Gen Con. That's so offensive. So let's let's go into. We mentioned it earlier. A remaster set last year. Dominaria remastered came out. Mm-hmm. We claimed this one to be because there was more controversy, of course, at Wizards of the Coast putting out the shitty 30th year anniversary product. Oh, God of 60 randomized proxies, basically. Yeah. Well, Dominaria, we kind of. You know, we thought was more of an actual 30-year celebration of Magic the Gathering. It was a much better celebration of the history of Magic with one of the original planes in Dominaria, one of the most historic planes in Dominaria. And it wasn't just the original Dominaria set. They actually added in some other stuff. I think it was like 23 different sets. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, So, like, they curated a bunch of cards from different sets. Like, some of the cards that were reprinted were cards that showed up. Or like two or three cards from a set, not yeah. like a whole set. But they curated a list of cards from a whole bunch of Dominaria appearing sets. Uh, curated it into a great, a relatively good draft experience from what I've heard. I haven't... We didn't draft it. We didn't draft it. Um, Maybe that was a mistake on our part. Eh, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bigger fan. Of, I feel like I'm a bigger fan of the like sealed, constructed, and mm-hmm. draft environments than the rest of our play group is. That's fair. Um, but like... But even like shit like Jumpstart, I love. Oh yeah, and that's like that's like baby's first draft <laughs> in a lot of ways. Or baby's first sealed constructed. Yeah, yeah, because it does the constructing for you. It really does. <laughs> uh, I've just most of these I've gone through, but uh, uh, and 
just pulled the most expensive card just because I thought it was neat. Uh, this year, or for Dominary Master, it was the Force of Will. Yeah, you cracked that one. I did. So we a bit of a meme amongst ourselves is that I have really good luck pulling cards. Yeah. And you started the year by far with the best pull. Oh, yeah. With uh, with that Altar Force of Will, which you haven't really played with. It's I mean, kept it in a frame. I've kept it in a frame. It's just one of those things that in our play group, up, maybe up to this point, we're starting to move more into a little, a little bit higher power. But a free counter spell isn't necessarily we've been something we've been interested in playing with mm. up to this point. Like I said, that's fair. that's fair. I would throw it in a trade binder when we go out and about just to see. You might get a cool offer for something you actually want to play. Maybe you never know. Maybe you never know. Uh, after that, we had Phyrexia. All will be one. The second installation in the Phyrexian War mm -hmm. um, set. Or this this set was the one I was super into. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, for me, the year goes to Lord of the Rings. We'll get to that later. Yeah. But Phyrexia All Will Be One was a very, very good set to start the year off with. Yeah. Uh, it came with two... Um, Two commander decks focusing one focusing on the corrupting the corrupting mechanic and one focusing more on the four Mirrodin and um, token strategy. This uh, you actually got the the toxic and corrupted command uh, backup the commander. Com I got I got uh, Ixel Scion of Atraxa as part of the ninety nine, which mm -hmm. is the face commander, and then I uh, I purchased Vishgraz the Doom Hive to build around that mechanic because I liked the the idea of the ETB trigger to get. Um, to get a bunch of the one one toxic mites, yeah, uh, and then his own growth ability based on poison counters at the table. Uh, I could have been a dick and built it around infect as opposed to toxic, but I only have a couple infect cards, and they're like mana dorks basically. Yeah, um, but I liked building around that idea with a lot of blink effects, with um, just, just stuff that'll get him to enter the battlefield a whole lot to just get a very wide board state. Uh, poison is a fun mechanic to fuck around with, and I think toxic is a more, ironically, less toxic way to go about <laughs> using poison counters in gameplay. Uh, I think for Mirrodin was interesting. I liked the I I always love the idea of equipment cards that enter the battlefield and then automatically attach to something, yeah, or create something to attach to. Mm -hmm. uh, which we we saw a lot of the we saw some automatic equip stuff with. Um, the some Baldur's Gate and D and D cards in yeah. the past, and then like uh, what was it, Kamigawa? With Kamigawa the, had the creature equipments. Yeah, the creature equipments where you could reconfigure them to create equipment out of them. But yeah, those are two. Those are two strategies that kind of kind of vibe with me. So yeah, um, the most expensive card from Mortar the Machine, or sorry, from Frexia All Will Be One, uh, was the. Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, in set foil. Yes, the Mommy of Mommies. Uh, we both got an Elish Norn pulled. Yeah. Uh, mine's in my trade binder right now. I had the um, the Phyrexian, or the black and white, like the showcase art. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and you had the standard. The standard Mommy. Elish Mommy of Mommies. Mommy of Mommies. Yeah. I, that was probably, it was a great, it was a good start. It was a good set to start the year with. Uh, followed up by not as great of a set. <laughs> yeah, March of the Machines came out next, and this was the final set in the Phyrexian Invasion. Um, we saw a bunch of planes that we've, uh, you know, the, throughout Magic's history getting invaded. Uh, we got a new permanent type in this set, which was the Battles, attackable permanents that you give to another player to control, and when they get defeated, you flip them over and get to cast a new thing. Uh, this set... This was supposed to be the real, one of the biggest sets probably of the year, I'm guessing, because they had so much to it. They had multiple set mechanics, including backup, convoke, incubate. They had five commander decks to it. Um, and this set dropped the ball. Yeah. The they had this set included a lot of interesting uh, designed cards. And it created a lot of interesting commanders by taking two figures across the multiverse and combining them onto one card as like the the dual command. They're not actually like partner commanders or yeah. like two different commanders at the same time. It's two characters on the same card. So like a uh, Galta and Maverin. Yeah. Interesting combination. Or Dejero and Hazaret. Slimefoot and Squee. Uh, uh, Saint Borborygmos and Thibblethip. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. hilarious combinations of characters uh, 
Uh, so there's an, a ton of amazing um, commanders to build around and yeah. interesting things. But as far as a, a set goes, uh, it didn't really have – like the backup The backup ability was interesting a little bit. Convoke is powerful, and so there's like a, some singles from, that have Convoke that are useful in various yeah. formats. Um, incubate, not really important unless you're doing like a Phyrexian tribal or Phyrexian yeah. typal style thing. Um, and then the battles, very slow card type. Uh, it, it takes it like if you're trying, you can't really have a, a damage dealing, just combat win condition for battles because then you're directing your damage at something else. Yeah. Um, the, the, the battles that I run, I only run for the front side. Yeah. (laughs) If I get the backside, cool. But, uh, even when it goes to the commander decks, First off, no battles in any of the commander decks, um, which was you think that they oh we're gonna put in a new type let's make no um, no battles printed since also also true which we th- we would say we were saying that it would make a lot of sense to put them in the Lord of the Rings set with the number of battles there the ba- the battle at Pelennor Fields the battle, the, battle Helms Deep. Deep fucking attacked on the like the the warg strike on the on the caravan mm-hmm. and the ro- like there's so many ba- the battle at the Bywater no that's Battle of the Bywater is Game of Thrones, right? No, 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 no. No, it's not. No, it's not. Battle of the Bywater is Lord of the Rings. I thought I, I thought I had a, I almost had a panic attack. Battle of the Bastards is Game of Thrones. Battle of the Bastards is. Uh, but yeah, so, and then of the Commander decks, um, we didn't play any of the Commander decks. One of the, but I've watched a lot of videos, a lot of reviews. One of them was good, which mm-hmm. was the Cavalry Charge. Uh, two of them were okay, which was Growing Threat and uh, Divine Convocation. And two of them were bad. Which was the call for backup in the Tinker Time, yeah. Uh, which kind of, and also, which leads me to, you don't need to make five commander decks. I get that there was a lot of cool things to put together. Might be too much for your design team there. Yeah. Um, well, it, it was it was clear in retrospect that they were trying to jam too much into March of the Machines, mm-hmm. trying to wrap up the Phyrexian invasion. I didn't even talk about the story yet. Yeah. Um, well. March of the Machine was going to be like the the Phyrexians are invading, all the planes are getting fucked up, and then also it's the resolution. Like, all we want is the Phyrexians are out there invading. March of the Machines is everyone's fighting, and now also it's resolved. Yeah. And you didn't get you didn't get the three act structure of anything. Yeah, literally everyone died. <laughs> Every bad guy just kind of died within the matter of moments. Um, in in. Anyway, so uh, the this is also kind of telling that the most expensive co- card, not counting serialized cards, was is Shieldred, the True Scripture, uh, Shieldred on the front, a uh, Saga on the back, uh, and that one only came in at sixteen thirty three. Yeah, and that's a and is there are those current prices? Yeah, these were of last week. Yeah, um, I mean at the time people were really excited for a lot of the the two commander like two character commanders yeah uh and there's a lot of interesting things to to build around with that but i mean i have shieldred and shieldred's just kind of slapped into my legendary tribal deck with joda just because ah fun things yeah here's all the cool legendary creatures i got yeah and it is what it is uh march of the machines followed by the fucking dumbest yeah the so, dumbest set that they've probably ever released. <laughs> that would be March of the Machines Aftermath, which was an heavy air quotes epilogue set. This set only contained 50 unique cards, uh, a lot of them featuring de-sparked planeswalkers. A great idea that could have been part of uh, an Aftermath or Victory set yeah. where they made it just a full set. I think it was very clear that that's kind of what they wanted to do. And then they had to jam everything together and wrap it up before Tales of Middle Earth. Yes. I, yeah. This we we opened a box of this not when it came out because it was oh god no full price. You were basically paying the same. You got five cards in a pack. Oh, that's oh, don't even get me fucking started on the epilogue boosters. Oh, the epilogue. You got five cards in a pack. They were only fifty cards total. No, there were no commons. No commons. No commons. But they were the same price as a fifteen card set booster. Epilogue boosters were priced at the same price or even a little bit more um, than a regular booster pack at release. Mm-hmm. And 
like they have there's like a lot of interesting and useful card cards like filter out is useful uh my beloved narset enlightened exile comes from comes from aftermath i yeah. love that card but when you're oh, so we bought a box of it over black friday yes because we could buy a box for forty dollars so 20 bucks each and we opened and we each opened half and we kept getting the same cards over and over. Opening a box of this is repetitive. Yeah. Because you just get the same uncommons over and over and over again. Because there's only 50 cards in the set. And then the chase uh, mythics and rares, you get one of per pack. Yeah. Um, and and even that, they felt like bulk rares. A lot of them are bulk rares. I mean, even Narset and Land Exile, I love that card. It's like a dollar. Yeah. Like, it's nothing special. Uh, obviously, and you... You have the most expensive card here with Obnixilis. It's the foil alt art at $57. dollars. And Obnixilis is a cool design card. Yeah. Um the the Nissa Ascendant Animist is a cool card. The Not, Calyx. Yeah. I love Calyx. Buy the singles. This set sucks. Um the concept the concept itself sucks. Yeah. Everything that came out of the concept sucked. Sucked. Some of the card designs are neat. Yes. Uh, Markov Baron, great for your vampire tribal deck. Mm -hmm. It's a 50 cent card. Buy it, buy, cent. buy it as a single. You could probably, you could I probably pulled, get every card in the set for less than the box originally sold for. Originally sold for, sure. Just one copy of, well, I don't know. And this says send an animus is still like a $25 card mm. on you, just the cheapest version, you know? So it, it so don't want Nissa, and you can just buy the rest. Of them. You find you find a box on sale for twenty five to thirty bucks. Sure, mm -hmm. why not? Go for it. You're gonna have a lot of uh, campus restorations. Oh yeah, you're gonna have a lot, a lot of, of undercity growth. Ooh, Talarian contempt. Oh yeah, <sighs> this, so stupid. This is one of those things that game store owners oh. are super unhappy with. Furious uh, wizards for it's like okay. You made me buy this at full price, and now I can't sell it. No one wants to buy it because it's shit. Mm -hmm. I do want to uh, go to the TikTok live chat because this is pertinent. Uh, Tyson Svensson, uh, they never explained the D-Spark at oh, all yeah. in the lore. Uh, and then also Frankie the Frenchie. Oh, uh, Aftermath, wor Aftermath, worst set of all time. Urborg Scavengers is the cue to start, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes to both. The Airborne Scavengers uh, is adorable, and it's actually a pretty cool card. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the the lore, we're not we don't get too huge into lore, but yeah, the the aftermath set. I mean, the D sparked ones were were just all over the place. It's like uh, Tyson also says the ending slash aftermath should have been its own set. Yeah, a they, full a full set of what happened after the Phyrexian invasion would have been cool. March of the Machines would have been amazing of like, here's all these planes and all of these iconic Heliod getting Phyrexian at like the, the, the transform mechanic on the num on all these cards that are getting Phyrexianized is oh, yeah. awesome. And then leave it as the multiverse is in a state of chaos and yeah. they're getting fucked up like Theros. The way they were able to Phyrexianize Heliod was they Phyrexianized all of the people of Theros. Yeah. All, all, every single person that worshipped Heliod became a Phyrexian, and so he became a Phyrexian. Mm -hmm. And that's fucking cool. And guess what? It, even, even the like, oh, we cut, we cut Elish Norn's head off and now everyone that's Phyrexianized is fine. Yeah. Whatever. But. Like the building on a Traxa. Sure. But. Maybe do that in the next set. Yeah. Make it look bleak. Also, if we want to get more into the lore, all these Phyrexianized Planeswalkers oh, didn't yeah. die. They've been they've been mutilated. They have been completely changed by the oil. They have had body parts replaced with machine parts. Oh, here they are. They're just fine now. Yeah, Nahiri's good. Yeah. No problem. Chandra and Nissar, mm -hmm. perfectly happy together again. Mm -hmm. Chandra got someone die. someone should have died. Nobody did. Tamio died. Tam well. She's not dead dead, though. She got her head cut off by Elish Norn. She's not. She is now haunting her son. Not dead dead. <laughs> She's haunting. Not Elish Norn by the Wanderer, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
All right, let's be done with aftermath. We have we have we have raged. Your, our blood pressures are here. Now for the best thing to happen in 2023. The Lord of the Rings: Tales of Middle Middle Earth, Universes Beyond, featuring one of the most iconic fantasy series of all time. No, the most iconic fantasy series of all time. Sam, I'm taking control here. This one's this one's. I, I go I'm taking it. the fucking mouse. You may have that. I'm taking this. Okay. So, the big the big set mechanics. The ring tempts you. Adding a, an, an emblem that you can very easily acquire, mm-hmm. uh, ring bearers, a um, whole lot of very powerful abilities that are wonderful to build around, uh, as well as the amass mechanic with amass orcs, which kind of meshes with the other amass cards, but also has its own thing, creating orc armies. Some of the most thematic and flavorful cards of all time, Gimli, counter of kills, Legolas, counter of kills, because they're constantly counting their kills, uh, a new four color card mm-hmm. not very many 14 total four color cards with now nine total commanders two of them three of them this year wow with atraxa and aragorn and uh the doctor the 14th I one of the doctor cards from doctor who uh aragorn the uniter this set full of flavor full of beautiful art aragorn's black uh legolas is still white who cares <laughs> uh freaking theoden looks like um Looks like the king from The Walking Dead. <laughs> Fucking cool as shit. Humans, powerful tribe again. Fucking, or, okay, let's get to the commander decks. Riders of Rohan, Jeskai, one of the great color combinations of all time. You get Eowyn, the shield maiden for humans. And then you get Aragorn, king of Gondor, for the beloved monarch mechanic. Oh yeah, great mechanic. Wonderful mechanic. Food and fellowship, Abzan, Partner commanders, Sam Loyal Attendant, Frodo Adventurous Hobbit. Uh, you also got Mary, Warden of Isengard, and Pippin, Warden of Isengard. You also had Bilbo, yeah. the only truly Abzan card mm-hmm. in the entire deck. You really had three, three possible commanders. commanders yeah. And Bilbo's is fun because if you get up to 111 life, you basically win because he's 1100 11, 11, years old. 111. And all of his guests show up, and that must that's going to include things like probably uh, elder dinosaurs and dragons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> By far. Uh, you also get the Elven Council, Simic. It's led by Galadriel. It's uh, Scry Elves. Uh, it's it's the voting one. Yeah, it's the voting one. So it, that one actually Scry. had like seven different cards you could play as the commander. Yeah. And it had three different. It had the voting. It had giant spells, and it had the scry thing. Yeah. It and was it, it was a little bit less. It uh, was unfocused. It was a little bit less focused. But then you got hosts of Mordor, Grixis, led by Sauron, Lord of the Rings himself, and then Sauron on the White Hand, Spellslinger, a mass, and then Sauron having the ward sacrifice permanent. Yes. Also, anytime anyone casts a spell, you amass orcs one. Also, like, the commander decks are fucking great. The set is designed phenomenally. It enables so many strategies. It has so many cards that are ubiquitous across all formats. It's modern legal. It wasn't standard legal. But it's modern legal. Commander, like, set of the year. I have attempted to collect the entire thing. You can get the the Nazgul. You can have nine copies you of the can. Nazgul. I have nine copies of the Nazgul in a deck and also in a binder. I'm collecting the fucking set. The cards, great. The theme, great. The one ring, shattering formats. Orcish Bowmaster, shattering formats. That might not necessarily be a good thing, but it's fucking cool. <laughs> I pulled five Orcish Bowmasters. I pulled zero. I pulled five. That was pretty cool. I've traded two of them away. (laughs) Two of them are in a binder. One of them's in a fucking frame. The most expensive card in the set, the one ring. The, what is it? Oh, not including any of the fancy versions. You can get $84 $84 probably in foil. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, again, not counting play promos or uh, uh, secret layer drops. Or, of course, the big one of one of one ring uh, currently owned by one post Malone. Yeah, that card wasn't necessarily a great thing. It kind of it kind of made like uh, Willy Wonka golden ticket style chase out of the collector boosters, which yeah. you know. And then also, I'm I'm it might be later down the the second edition set that came out in the winter with the scene boxes, some really amazing flavorful cards that you know was probably a little bit overpriced, but you know whatever. I got them for Christmas. You got them for Christmas. It's fine for those two that you bought. Yeah, the, the three that I bought. Um, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> Anyway, Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth set of the year. 
They they nailed it with the flavor of the cards. They nailed it with the art of the cards. They fucking they if they had not gone all out, um it would have not been good for them. Mm-hmm. Oh, they went all out. They went all out and I believe it is the best selling Magic the Gathering set definitely of the year. I believe it might be of all time. Period. Uh, yeah, it of is all time. it is of all time. I mean, it has broad appeal. Uh it enables every format has cards that you now want to have and the great thing because this set was so popular and they sold so many cards a lot of really fucking great cards are very inexpensive oh yeah very like uh the delighted halfling the mana dork that can tap for any color in your commander's colors uh and makes the makes the the spell that you're casting with it uncounterable cavern cavern souls cavern souls on a mana dork and uh you can get it for like a buck Really, it's down to a buck. It's it's like a buck or two. Like it's not. It was fifteen bucks at one. Point. It was when the set came out. the The Nazgul cards were fifteen dollars when they came out too. They're below five now. Hmm. So a lot of the card prices have come down quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Delighted halfling is great. Uh, food strategies, a mass strategies, equipment strategies, monarch strategies. Uh, there's some great burn support, fiery inscription, Gimli counter of kills. Uh, the goblins got a boost. Elves, of course. Elves got a massive boost. It's this. It's a good set. It's a good set. It's a good set. Oh, spell Great Slinger, set even. Spell Slinger got <laughs> support. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Some uh, Lorian revealed apparently is like a good card now. That was a common. That's over a dollar. Yeah. Um. You. Brand new counterspell with Stern Scolding, a one mana counterspell that hits some of the most pesky creatures available, including now Orcish Bowmasters, <laughs> uh, hitting things like Ragavan. Like, damn good set, set of the year, set of set of all time. Amen. Best set. I can't wait to make my set cube out of it. Well, I'm gonna bring you down a little bit. Oh yeah. As we move on to the next set that dropped, uh, probably way too close to Lord of the Rings. Way, it, way too close. It way, dropped, way, way too close. It dropped over Gen Con weekend uh, while we were there, and we got to play it when it came out, which was the Commander Masters. Um, this is a set that was featuring some of the most some of the most iconic Commander cards of all times, and did have some new powerful cards as well. A lot, uh, of, a lot of good reprints. A lot of great reprints. Missing a few key ones, though. Missing a few key ones, and also, um, why are we... Why are, why are we charging more for the... I mean, it's Master set, sure, but... Uh, you're missing a lot of good shit, and then also we'll get into. We'll get, yeah, we'll get into. It. So they did have uh, four commander decks that did include new cards, um, especially the commanders. Uh, the Sliver Swarm, a re, uh, uh, which looks like it got changed to Sliver Sword. Anyway, it was a Wooberg uh, deck led by the Sliver Grave Mother, and uh, the backup was the Sliver Hive Ward, and it focused on slivers. Yeah, because we need more sliver support. Um, then we had the Planeswalker Party, which was in Jeskai, led by Commodore Guff and Leoria, uh, Leo, Leori, the Spark, Hunt, Spark Touched Hunter. It was a Super Friends deck. Yeah, a lot of um, Planeswalkers, not great in Commander, but it's a fun archetype. And Commodore Guff, not a splashy Commander by any means, but just kind of enables all other Planeswalkers. Yeah. Um, we had the Enduring Enchantments, which is an Absan, led by Anicthia, Hand of Erebos, and Narsi Fable Singer. Which was an enchantress, an enchantress reanimator strategy. Yeah, uh, aka the best commander deck. Honestly, kind of was. It was so fu- it's so fucking good. I basically kept it bog standard and just upgraded it a little bit. Yeah, and like that's just it's a great deck. I had the planeswalker party and I disassembled it. Uh, and then of the last one was the Eldrazi Unbound, which was the first colorless commander deck that precon, uh, led by Zuladoc Voidgorger and Omarith Ghost Fire Initiate. And of course, is focusing on large, casting large spells. Ooh, spell uh, I want to. I want to issue a correction mm. from. Thank you, Frankie the fr- the Frenchie. Uh, Delighted halfling is ten dollars. Okay, that's still that's still cheaper than what it was. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, um, we like I said, I played the pa- planeswalker one. It was a little slow. Um, you're you enjoyed the enduring enchantments one. Enduring enchantments is by far the most fun to play of them all. I think. 
Uh, slivers, you're the target of everything. Uh, the Eldrazi colorless one, it takes way too long to get going. Planeswalkers, you just don't have enough power. Enduring Enchantments was, at least in the games that we were playing in Gen Con mm-hmm. and the games that we've played since, I think is the most well-made deck. Yeah. But... It was also immediately followed by a set with a bunch of enchantments in it and a bunch of enchantment reprints. Yeah. Including um, powerful enchantments that were reprinted here in Commander Masters. Yeah. But they but instead in Wilds of Eldraine they're included in like three dollar booster packs instead of like seven dollar booster packs. Yeah. Not yeah. You know. And also, uh, as a note, the most expensive card from Commander Masters was of course the reprint of Jeweled Lotus in Foil Alt Art. It was a f- almost a four hundred dollar card right now. Uh, I pulled a basic jeweled lotus in the standard art non-foil yeah and that's like an 80 dollar card yeah i was uh we were talking to, i was talking to our friend lincoln and uh he was around the time the set came out and he was like oh yeah now that a bunch of these reprints oh you should buy some jeweled lotuses while they're cheap i'm like they're still 70 dollars they're like what and he pulls up his phone he's like they got reprinted and there's st- not only did they stay at the price they maybe dropped down a few bucks but then they went up in price yeah so some art variants are higher in price now and and th- we'll get to it later. The same thing happened with Mana Crypt for yeah. Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Oh, yeah. This this set was not cheap. And while it had good cards, it didn't have necessarily have good cards that everybody who plays Commander would want. Mm-hmm. It has a lot of high-power cards. But if you're playing in high-powered decks, you're probably already buying those cards without trying to crack them in packs. Yeah, yeah. The, <sighs> the, the best way to get some reprints... From the next set, Wilds of Eldraine. <laughs> yeah, the, this was the return to the uh, to Eldraine, a plane focused on fairy tales. Um, it had advent, it had the set mechanic included adventure cards, which was an old mechanic that they brought back. You have uh, uh, instant or sorcery on one side. You play it, you exile it, you bring it back later as a creature or an enchantment or an artifact. Some kind of a permanent. Uh, they also created the new roll tokens, which are aura tokens. It can only have one roll attached, so it's a little bit balanced in mm-hmm. that way. I think that's. I like the I like the roll tokens. Roll tokens are neat. Uh, it needs more. It need they need more cards that create roll tokens now. Absolutely. Uh, they also had a bonus sheet. Yeah. So the bonus sheet uh, we've been seeing a couple times now, but this was one of the best with the enchanting tales. Mm-hmm. So many great enchantment reprints, including reprints that were reprinted in Lost in uh, in Commander Masters. Masters, and then immediately reprinted again in Wilds of Eldraine. Uh, and the Eldraine packs were a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, they need to do and more bonus. They need to do a lot more bonus sheets like that. You could also pull things like Doubling Season in draft packs and use yeah, it. Yeah, there was there was a while cool. there was a bonus sheet in uh, uh, included in every pack. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously there were still some ones that show up a lot, it, but they were good reprints. Still. I believe they called it Enchanting Tales specifically because yeah. it was all enchantments. Yeah, there's a lot of great enchantments that are reprinted, including some like more common staples that instead of being like five to 10 bucks are now like a buck, which is great. It's exactly what they need to be doing. Uh, as far as the set goes, I wasn't super jazzed. I think I was a bit enchantment. I, that was like, I think that's my own personal thing. Cause I was enchantmented out yeah. with, uh, with the enchantment precon and playing with that a whole lot from commander masters. Uh, the precons that they included were like, they're pretty, they're pretty fine. Yeah. Virtue and valor being a, an, enca- an enchantment one. Um, and the Fey Dominion being a fairies deck, mm-hmm. which a lot of people have been excited about the new fairy commander. Oh, yeah. Alila, uh, Alila was the backup commander for this one, but she was the original fairy commander, kind of. Um, the most expensive card in this set was Agatha's Soul Cauldron and the extended art at fifty six fifty nine. Yes, and that's not including the bonus sheet stuff, because I bet doubling season's a lot more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one's all you. The next one is the Commander Who Universes Beyond, or the Doctor Who Commander decks from Universes Beyond. Uh, so this was ba- a Universes Beyond set based on one of the top longest running British sci-fi fantasy series and included new plane chase cards, which we forgot to mention that uh, in March of the Machine, there were also plane chase cards. Yeah, those are all plane chase cards included in the Commander decks. Yes, yes. And they didn't cost anything more, which was pretty cool. Which was nice. Um, There were four decks, the Blast from the Past, which was led by the Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. This focused on the pre-2005 era of Doctor Who, so from like the 60s on. Uh, Timey Wimey from the, was the Tenth Doctor and Rose. That was the more modern. Uh, then we had the Masters of Evil, which was in Grixis, uh, led by Davros or Missy, and that was just being the bad guys, which is always fun. And then Paradox Power, led by the Thirteenth Doctor and Yasmin Khan. 
Um, and this one focused on escape, cascade, flashback, and retrace. Kind of just casting cards from not your hand. Mm -hmm. um, the most expensive card from this deck, from this set, was the Tenth Doctor and Alt Art Foil. Um, not counting the serialized cards. Which this was interesting because they had the Doctor Who Commander decks. But then they also had collector booster packs. Mm -hmm. And they were just cards from the Commander decks. Yep, just in foil. Yeah. Some of them in foil. Some of the, most of them in foil, and some of them in extended art. Yeah, uh, it was the the from what I've heard, the actual decks themselves were more flavorful than mechanically good. Mm -hmm. With with the Grixis one being the best. I don't know. Overall, I think I I what I did was I bought a couple of cool cards from the set. I didn't need the I didn't need the decks. Mm. Uh, your birthday present, I believe, was a collector booster pack. It was yes. Yeah. yeah. Didn't get anything super great from it, but you got yeah. one card that like has been repeatedly fuck that blue card that's been repeatedly fucking us up in games. Oh, the quantum uh, yeah. entanglement or whatever. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one's not fun. That's great. It's that a card. good card. It's a great <laughs> it's card. A good card. Uh, moving on, we have the Lord of the Rings holiday re-release as well as the scene boxes. Do yeah, you so take over again. They they redid the collector boosters. Uh, they were special edition collector booster packs where it was a reprint of the entire base set of uh, Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth, and they added a new frame art to it. Uh, those are what they are. They're worth a bit more. You could also get Surge Foil uh, in those, so it's a new foiling pattern that look really, really nice. Uh, you also got the Scene Boxes, which included the Might of Galadriel, uh, Aragorn and Helm's Deep, Gandalf at the in the Pelennor Fields, and Flight of the Witch King. The scene boxes were all extended art foil cards that were new design cards. Um, and they would come with like a little cardboard frame that you could put them all in, and then the cards would create a scene when mm -hmm. lined up together. They also included art cards, so you could actually get a better view of the scene itself. Um, the cards range wildly in value. Uh, they include a lot of interesting mechanics. They they include things like Annihilator on like the Nazgul Battle Mace, uh, Shadow Counters, uh, Renown, Exalted, uh, and then one of one of the most valuable ones coming from the Aragorn and Helm's Deep with Legolas's Quick Reflexes, yeah. which is a one mana instant split second card. So it removes the ability to interact with it in a lot of ways. Um, and then that just basically is giving hexproof and untapping and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff to a target creature for one mana at instant speed is very good. Um, a lot of the cards in them are pretty decent. They also included three regular Tales of Middle-earth set booster packs. They should have been three holiday edition collector booster packs in my mind. Yeah. Because each of these scene boxes was $30. So yeah. you, for $30, you were getting three booster packs and six cards. And some of them, like... Legolas's Quick Reflexes is like a $20, $25 card. So that one's kind of worth it. Yeah. But you're kind of going for luck of the draw with the set boosters. I don't I don't see why they wouldn't just include the – because they're wizards. Yeah. Because they're Hasbro. Sorry. Especially because that, because that alt art – or the alt frame mm -hmm. is like the kind of the new thing. So why not, yeah, just include things that are going to come in those alt frames. Why not do the alt frame for just the regular set? I don't know. Because they use the universes beyond um, frame for the set, and that's very. It looked it looked weird. It looked a little weird. It I think looks, it, it's very metallic. Yeah, I got you. Get used to it, but on first look, it's like ah, oh, this is this is it feel it felt. I think it was because of the the Warhammer commander decks. It, it definitely felt, felt more sci-fi. It felt sci-fi instead of fantasy. But then like you just kind of get over that ultimately. But that's fair. As far as far as the scene boxes go, I wouldn't necessarily recommend them. The collector boosters are cool, but they're also cheaper than the original run of the collector boosters because for some reason those are still inflated in price, probably because of a lack of supply yeah. from people chasing the one of one one ring. Yeah. Um, the, I would, a prediction. 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 You'll be able to get these scene boxes and the holiday edition collector boosters for a lot cheaper in the coming months. Yeah, probably. I bet. Probably. I bet not a lot of people are going to be buying them, so I suspect they're going to be fairly inexpensive, relatively. Right. The last set of the year to come out would be the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. We return to the Plain of Ixalan, which is based around you know dinosaurs, pirates, vampires, and merfolk. The things you would expect. Yeah. Uh, All those things go together very well. <laughs> the set mechanics included Discover, which is a quote-unquote fixed form of Cascade. Uh, Descend, 
which triggers on things being put in the graveyard, craft using uh, resources to flip artifacts into different artifacts, and explore the ability to check the top of your deck and find lands or buff creatures. Um, there were four four commander decks here. The Pirates run was Ahoy Mates and Grixis. Uh, Vampires was Orzov Blood Rites. The Explorers in, of the Deep was a Simic that was for Merfolk. And the Velociraptor was a Naya uh, Dinosaurs deck. Um, what we, do you al think? we also got Jurassic Park. We also did get the Jurassic Park. Um, we got uh, Chris Pratt. Yeah. We got a, we got a Velociraptor. Two Blue. Velociraptors. A couple of, couple of the... A T-Rex. A couple of T-Rexes. And some tokens. I got a command tower. That was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, we're not Jurassic Park fans, really. I thought the cards were cool and I wanted some because, you know, it's cool to have. But, uh, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Of, what do you think of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan? As far as the magic universe sets go, I think this is probably the best one of the year. I think so too. I think it, it was between this and Phyrexia all will be one, and it might just be recency bias, but I like the variety and the general power level of commons and uncommon, just yeah. the pool of cards and Lost Caverns of Ixalan a bit more than all will be one. Yeah. It really gave support to Merfolk. It gave support to Pirates. Uh, it gave us a new three color dinosaur commander because mm -hmm. before it was only Gishath. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, uh, vampires didn't really need help. Vampires didn't need help, but they got like they got like just a nice suite of options yeah. available. So I'm I'm all for it. I mean, it helped. It it improved my vampire deck a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I I got some set boosters at Walmart, and uh, I pulled an alt art mana crypt. Yeah, you did. It's 170 dollars. Didn't do it on stream. I just I just picked up some packs because I was at Walmart and I was like yeah sure fifteen bucks why not yeah people you're facetiming with your girlfriend at the point yep uh, I was I was facetiming with uh, the lady friend and I I literally set down my phone and I just had it, like propped up and I was opening it and I said holy fuck and she was like what did you do <laughs> she was like you either either something has gone horribly wrong or you opened something and I'm like I opened up a card that is I know is very valuable and then I looked it up and I'm like that was hundred and seventy dollars. And now it's in a frame. Now it's on the wall. Uh, probably going to take it out of the frame when we go to SCG Con and throw it in the trade binder just to flex a little bit. Fair. Along with the jeweled lotus and the orcish bowmasters. Probably. I'm probably just gonna. I think we should just empty the frames and throw the throw the shit in just to be like, hey, just to see if there's any offers or anything. Maybe. Yeah, uh, real quick, let's. I want to look at the set mechanics. Um, discover. We like discover. Uh, descend. That's fine. The craft one. Yeah, that was the that was the weakest one by far. It's a fucking dead mechanic, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I think it's 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 something that it, it's if you have a card, if you have a, a card that has craft with on it, uh, and the front side is useful enough, and you want to use the front side, uh, it's a good thing to sink mana into and graveyard resources if you're not using them in the late game if you don't have a lot of options. Um, but if you don't have the options, you really need to upgrade, upgrade your deck to have those options instead yeah. of just waiting to craft something. Yeah. So uh, explore, explore has always been good. Uh, descend and having des descending and descended mm -hmm. uh, permanence entering the graveyard and then getting abilities off of them, I think is a great great thing. And it, it uh, soups up aristocrats and sacrifice strategies. Uh, it makes. Uh, clues and foods and treasures even better and the new map tokens even better oh yeah uh discover it's cascade but not as overpowered except it is yeah <laughs> they fixed it quote unquote they quote unquote fixed it uh also i want to shout out quintorius cond yeah new planeswalker because we're down to one planeswalker a set now Yes, he's a brand new Planeswalker. Uh, he's got Discover, and he has a static ability where you cast cards from Exile. He deals damage to to uh, opponents, and you gain life. Uh, very, a very good Oathbreaker now. Boros, and now with all the Discover cards. Um, oh, God, not the credit cards. You don't want cash the back? The cards with... I, I've, got, I've got cash back. I've got cash back. <laughs> I, don't use, I don't use Discover for my cash back. This is a Chase household. I have both Chase and Discover. I have Chase and... I have Chase and City and PNC. <laughs> and PNC. We're getting off track. <laughs> but uh, Discover ability cards. Yeah. I, I love the Discover mechanic. I think it's great. I love the cave lands. The cave lands, I think, are one of the coolest cycles of... of the, the coolest 
set land cycles. Yes. the there, It's a new land type with the cave land, and there's a whole lot of different... There's a colorless one where you can tap it and pay a life to get any color, mm -hmm. which is useful. Great mana fixing. Uh, one that gives plus one, plus one counters. And then uh, one for each color that enters tapped. And then you can pay, I believe it's four or five mana into it to sacrifice the land and then discover four yeah. and just get a free cast off the top, which is... Like, I think the cycle lands, the lands where you pay a mana or pay two mana to cycle them are a bit more useful, but I really love the discover mechanic, and I think those lands have a place mm -hmm. uh, and are very useful, and I've included them in a lot of decks that yeah. are going to benefit, and you very easily open them. They appear in a lot of packs. Yeah. All right. Uh, and also, the most expensive card from Lost Caverns Exelon, Exelon is the Neon Red Alt Art Cavern of Souls at mm -hmm. $300, $315. All right. So that's that's all of 2023 in a nutshell. <sighs> Big nutshell. Oof. Uh, so obviously, I think both of our favorite set of the year was Lord, Lord of, the of the Rings. By far. By far. Uh, Lost Caverns of Exelon. That's good one of the best ones really liked all will be one a lot of a lot of great support a lot of great mechanics too many cards yeah and then of course lowest points was going to be aftermath yeah by far by far uh also a fuck ton of secret layers fuck ton of secret layers way too many secret layers always too many uh i i was i was ranting to myself earlier because no one was home so i was ranting to the cat about uh some secret layers earlier um mm -hmm. maybe so, anyway so just a quick look at 2024 and beyond. Obviously, we've announced things we know for 2024, but we also know that in 2025, we're going to get Innistrad Remastered. We're going to get the first tentpole set for Marvel. The first. Yep. And Final Fantasy. I'm excited for Final Fantasy. I think that'll be fun. Next yeah. year, Next year, there isn't really anything that's really speaking to me. We'll see when the sets come out. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I kind of don't want to do the next part. <laughs> that's, well, here we it are. happened. Well, here, real quick. Tw uh, do we have a, f a catchy name for 2023's Magic? The Magic? Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. Um. God. Tw New secret layer alert. New secret <laughs> layer alert. New secret layer alert. They released the equivalent of more than one secret layer per week. Yeah. Um. Just... I would do okay for 2023 for magic. I would just do um, the the milk ch the the milk the gallon milk challenge. The gallon milk challenge. Just just you gotta ch you gotta drink all. That. Oh, there's oh, it's way too much milk. I can't no keep chugging the milk. Keep chugging the milk. Vomit. Yeah. Okay. That's. <laughs> it's been a while since that was a thing. I mean, I guess it's continuously a thing, but since and that was big. Anyway. 2023 magic the milk challenge um all right now we're on to the news the things that he, we here at the dungeon bros talked about mm -hmm. ra ranted and raved about in the good times and were very sad more often so of course we can't go anywhere without the fact that the beginning of the year was just steeped in the ogl controversy uh they were this was the rebuilding era for the ogl controversy which it came to a head, and Watsi moved the reference documents and the Creative Commons uh, into, onto Creative Commons to appease the community. Um, so ultimately, we ended up in a position much better mm -hmm. than it was even before they tried to revise the OGL. Yeah, it's way more open now, but that was not what they wanted, and I'm sure uh, uh, Cynthia will she ruin Watsi is very furious with that. Oh yeah. Um, they also, with that promise that one D and D or just fifth edition, as it's going to be called, it will be also placed under the Creative Commons license, um, which of course is a third party uh, legal entity that once it's on there, you can't take it back. They can't. They can't. They can't mess with it. Yeah. And once something is into the Creative Commons, it is it is public domain, and you can no longer restrict it in any way yeah you so, can put restrictions on when you're putting it in saying you can use it for this this or this but not this yeah, and things they're like that and they're not putting everything like the art the book the printing the text of the books themselves are going to be like copy copyrighted by wizards of the coast as as any book would be yeah but set mechanics uh, the idea of subclasses yeah. like anything that you would be making homebrew out of basically have at it yeah 
You can even reprint. I bet you, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to reprint anything in the system reference document. So like verbatim stat blocks, verbatim subclasses, verbatim classes. Yeah. You can reprint and sell on your own if you really want to. But this being said, uh, we had Paizo announce that they were going, Paizo, of course, being one of the direct competitors of developers of Pathfinder, uh, announced that they were going to be making the Open RPG Creative License, or the ORC License. Um, I, there was a lot of fervor on the internet around the OGL and like a whole bunch of people jumping onto the ORC License. I feel like a lot of that has calmed down. Yeah. Uh, I think putting put thing, putting things into Creative Commons and making the pledge to do uh, one D and D in Creative Commons was probably the one thing they could have done to salvage it, and they did. Um, obviously, Paizo, Kobold Press, MCDM, a whole bunch of other things are making their own. A lot of them were going to be making their own RPG systems anyway, and yeah. they jumped on this as an opportunity to announce it to get uh, way more reach. Yeah, and right. that's totally fine. Uh, MCDM's Kickstarter recently happened. Yeah. This went very well. We know Paizo is, of course, established. And Cobalt Press, they announced Project Black Flag, Black Flag earlier in the year. I don't remember if anything's happened with that. I don't think anything else has happened since. But uh, moving on, something good. We got Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. That released on March 31st. I don't think anybody was really expecting this to be as good of a movie as it was. No. Because it wasn't, it wasn't in your face with references. Like It was just like a funny comedy adventure fantasy film and then if you were in the know you were in the know and you had insight yeah into a lot of the bits that would go over some people's heads but even if you had no clue what DD is it's a funny and entertaining movie and uh the audience score versus the critic score is one of those like the critics were like oh it's pretty all right and the audience was like this is great yeah yeah uh that was featured uh we got a 7.3 on IMDb, a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 72% on Metacritic. Mm-hmm. Rotten Tomatoes, known for uh, weighing the audience score quite a bit heavier, which is why that score is probably a lot higher. Um, yeah, we were big fans of this movie. Mm-hmm. We watched it shortly after it came out here at home. Yeah, it was great. I highly recommend it. A lot of people want a sequel to it. Uh, don't really know. Chris Pine has hinted at it a little mm-hmm. bit. Edgin, we would love him. We would love Chris Pine's bard to cast a spell. <laughs> that would be great. That'd we would stop neat. having to explain to the old people why the bard didn't cast any spells. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we had the we had two things. We had the D and D Direct and the Creator Summit. D and D Direct, of course, being something they've started to do a live stream where they talk about the upcoming things in Dungeons and Dragons. And back when it's the E three of D and D, the E three of D and D, and back at the time that it happened, we called it a waste of time. A oh, massive waste of time. They did announce some cool things like the Minecraft Dungeons and Dragons uh, collab, a new way to uh, a new website, which was playdnd.com, which was just directed to D&D Beyond. That's all it was. To make a character. It was just it was just here's a here's a new wrapping paper for D&D Beyond. It's the same fucking thing. They announced some overpriced action figures from for among among that for Honor Among Thieves, the 80s cartoon, Dicelings and life size action figures of Mimics and uh, Owlbear children. The Dicelings are neat. <laughs> That's, yeah. Ooh, was this also where we got the campaign cases? Yes, it was. Hey, you can find them at Ollie for like two bucks. Yeah, uh, yeah. The things that were originally sold for an MSRP of 40, they don't do MSRP, but MSRP of $40 that you can get on Amazon for like less than 20 and you can get at uh, bulk overstock retailers for like $3 now that are just little plastic coins, basically. Yeah. Stickers. And stickers. That was a dumb idea. (laughs) And And nobody bought them. Nope. Apparently not. That's why they're at Ollie. Uh, We also got an announcement of the new Dritz book. Sure. Um, And uh, they did update us on, in a really cringy way, on the new virtual tabletop. Yeah. The virtual tabletop and the integration with D&D Beyond in one D&D, I think, is one of the most exciting things in in their, like, expanded initiatives beyond just D&D. Mm-hmm. I would I would love to I would love to hear more about the virtual tabletop and I think it'd be cool if they released it with like VR headset support and stuff and like like a tabletop simulator like yeah. a little bit of that vibe going on for for VR versions of it it was cool but we don't have enough information on it to really talk on that right now. I mean back well so back when we were talking about that when they were talking about it they had announced that it was going to be a direct download from D&D Beyond. Mm-hmm. And we th- and we were very in, in, in the opinion that they should be just putting it on Steam. Just put it on Steam. Put it on the PlayStation Network. Like, get it, get it where people are actually playing games. 
you know? Yeah. If you're going to try and make, if you, now if it's software that is not a game, that's fair, but people also just put software on Steam. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, get, your launcher is not going to be as good as Steam's. No. Or Epic's. Period. Yeah. And if your launcher breaks, guess what? Now your tech team has to deal with it. Steam's launcher breaks, they're going to deal with it. Yeah. Um, Creator Summit also happened right, like I think a week or a af- uh, week or so after, and uh, that was the first time ha- the first time we saw a preview of the weapon masteries, mm-hmm. and then there were some additional virtual tabletop updates. Nothing, nothing really major. I think the main thing that the Creator Summit from people that went to it sounded like something that was a bit slapped together, and I'm sure it was just kind of a a lot of it was a reaction to their controversies, and they wanted to appear more open and be more open to their critics, which was the creators in the community. D&D Shorts, uh, Bob the World Builder, Ginny D, like a lot of people that they had partnered with Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people that may have made a lot of great content on Wizards products were there. Uh, It was it it was largely ultimately just kind of a a nothing event. Yeah. Yeah. The next big thing that happened was in the, the magic realm was the Pinkertons rated old school MTG who is over a over aftermath over aftermath so old school MTG is a YouTuber and otherwise content creator known for opening packs and he was given um 27 boxes of March of the Machines aftermath several weeks before they were set to release which On was accident. he ordered he ordered regular March of the Machines yeah and the thing is these only came out a few weeks, like two weeks, three weeks after March of the Machines. And obviously, you, you get something new. You get something early. You don't owe anything to Wizards of the Coast. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, the Pinkertons were sent to retrieve the boxes and threatened him with jail time. However, once a Wizards of the Coast official representative was able to speak to Old School, uh, no charges were pressed. And they were more concerned just finding the leak. Yeah. Um, also... The literal Pinkertons. Like yeah. those Pinkertons. From Red Dead. Yeah. From from the people who beat up strikers back in uh Yeah. Back in those times. Like like literal mafia shit. Yeah. Um Oh, a security company. That was that was a little fucked up, but whatever, man. Literally, if I mean, I, they could have hired any other security firm. They could have hired lawyers. I think lawyers would have been the right move. Lawyers are scary. They, they... won't beat you up scary, but they're scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I forgot about the D and D book price increases. Yeah, they announced that with starting with Bigby's uh, presents, they all book prices were going from forty dollars to sixty nine ninety nine. Yeah, and I bet they're not selling as many. Oh, probably not. This was also kind of uh, their their in, their words were that it was because of the the inflation and now printing books costs more which is fair i mean you look at the video game industry they they made a ten dollar increase from 60 to 70 dollars games honestly like, people don't like this games if they were to keep up with inflation would be like 140 dollars a game and the 70 dollar increase was almost immediately ate up eaten up by covid inflation oh yeah and they're making less on games at 70 dollars now than they were 60 dollars like three years ago um, it's fucked up. Yeah. This also uh, coincided with them talking about um, digital books. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that now books are going to start coming with digital codes that get you. That's good. Yeah. We like that. So the the one D&D, you're going to buy the physical book and then you're just going to have the digital one. Yep. Some quality. Like, they're, oh, they're starting to write the ship. They're getting they're getting an idea. They're getting they're getting some good. Mm-hmm. The, 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 this, this was the era where we were like, oh, they're st- they're. They're realizing they're fucking up a lot. You oh, know, yeah. Things are starting to go the right way. Things that weren't going the right way, though, <laughs> not related to Wizards of the Coast, but to, to new TSR, um, a, a company that was started back in 2020 by Ernie Gygax, Justin Lanassa, Jeff Leeson, and Stephen Dinehart. Um, they they were interested in bringing TTRPGs back to, I was air quotes for those of you on the audio only, back to uh, the way it was back in the 70s. Um, developing non-woke TTRPGs. Uh, well, they filed for Chapter 7 in June. Yeah, uh, they had... <laughs> they had $384,000 in outstanding liabilities. Their revenue, $621.91. I, I want to point something out. 
because we realized, I think we realized this a little bit yesterday. Yeah. The Dungeon Bros. That's us. Us on we, TikTok. And we made, we've made money on TikTok. We've made some money on uh, Drive Through RPG. And uh, like, like, we've made more revenue than new TSR. Oh, yeah. We've, we, we have higher, we have more, we made more money in 2023 than fucking new TSR. We did not make a lot of money. No. Not, neither of us are in a position where we can stop any of the real life work that we do. But we made more money than new TSR, and that's fucking hilarious. Yeah, we uh, we talked about new TSR. Barely, in, barely any more money, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, barely. Barely. But we talked about new TSR back in the day, back when this podcast was first starting because they were, they were under attack from the community, rightfully so, because they were putting – pretty racist things right into oh, yeah. right into writing oh yeah and uh, i will i will say the 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 tabletop rpg community is very very quick to jump and dogpile onto quote unquote uh, uh problematic mm-hmm. subjects that often aren't problematic this is one of the ones that actually like really fucking was yeah like this one was really problematic this was bad <laughs> and we 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 like to pat ourselves on the back because we said yeah, yeah don't work don't worry don't worry <laughs> stop suing them don't worry they're trying to put out something that's shit. The market will take care of them. And the market, de- as as any good capitalist will say, the market will decide. And the market decided. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, this year, excitingly though, uh, the podcast had a name change. Yeah, we are now the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. You heard our spiel at the top: the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, D and D and MTG podcast, formerly the Dungeon Bros podcast. Uh, no discoverability with that name whatsoever. Who the fuck are the Dungeon Bros? Uh, at least with duels and mana dorks, it's like, oh, that's a title at yeah. least, and you it kind of hints at the the actual subject matter. Yeah, hey, drop us a five star review if you're listening to this. Yeah, that's oh, great. on the on podca- podcast services around the globe. If you're listening at this point, and you go to a podcast server, like if you're listening at this point in the podcast, an hour and forty minutes in, which by the way, it's gonna be a long podcast. It's gonna be a long podcast. We've gone through a lot. We, we're almost there though. All right, let's wrap almost this shit there. up. Uh, Wayfarer's Bobble art plagiarization, uh, a new a new MTG controversy. Uh, artist David Saundered was called out on Twitter by Lorenzo Lanfran- uh, Lanfransoni for using Lan- Lorenzo's art in the background of Wayfarer's Bobble. Yeah, this was Ixalan. from this was from the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Yes, Commander Dex specifically. Yeah, um, Watsi updated that they would uh, were suspending any further work with Saundered. Uh, but Lanfran uh, Sony did not pursue any legal action with either the company or the artist. Yeah, Saundered, he he like did the character art and the like actual Wayfarer's Bobble, and he literally just copy pasted and like removed a, a a woman walking upstairs for background part of the art, and not even the whole background. Mm-hmm. Like it was arguably just more work to do. I, plagiarizing never makes sense and whenever like bigger people get caught plagiarizing the reasonings and like the logic behind like if you actually think about the logic of the process of doing that mm-hmm. it's oftentimes more work than just doing the thing yeah like I get deadlines and stuff and Watsy probably isn't great about that but like just slap some shitty trees in the background you don't need just because the other half of the, sky, of the box was shitty trees and yeah. the sky box yeah Make it more skybox and some more shitty trees in the background. Like it was more work to go find art, pull the art in, paint out the woman in the art, and then fix the the painting out like voided areas. Yeah, than to just make some fucking trees. It was hilarious. <sighs> Next, we have the D and D twenty four hour broadcast started. This, yeah, this cable channel. Cable channel on Amazon uh, free whatever that's called freebie. freebie it featured three brand new productions faster purple warm kill kill by matthew lillard a short form DD show with a rotating cast where the uh, and a dm where the yeah, where low level parties go up against a big bad monster and everyone dies uh we have heroes feast a DD cooking show and encounter party a campaign of, th- uh, of a third party group now returning for an additional season of their show now just on this platform uh, otherwise, they were utilizing 80s D&D cartoons to, and rebroadcasts of older streams, like the stream of many eyes, Salt Marsh, etc. All of this after they removed the uh, the production company that made... E1. Yeah. Their indie production company they sold off earlier this year. Yeah, for their new money-making venture on uh, what is effectively cable television. 
Yeah. Of course, Matthew Lillard, great person in the community, doing yeah. a lot. He owns Beetle and Grant. Or we need to get we need to get his Paladin bourbon. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, maker of bourbon, now maker of D and D shows. Of course, Shaggy. He was He's Shaggy great. at one point. Great live action Shaggy. He's the man. Other than that, we don't care. I watch. Oh, I the, to watch a little bit. The the cooking show. The guy that the guy that's the host of that. He used to be like the executive chef for McDonald's, and he oh. does. All, he's done like a lot of like funny. He, like he has a, a social media presence. I was gonna say I've seen him on TikTok before. Yeah, and he's done like uh, he's been on podcasts like on Kind of Funny and stuff, mm-hmm. and he's friends with them, and they had like they've had like a whole lot of bits. He's a funny dude. He's a cool dude. The people cool, but the shows not really fucking worth it. Yeah, and and again, it, other than that, they're just filling the time with the what three seasons of the 80s cartoon and just old yeah. restream broadcast that no one cares about yeah it's also damn hard to find yeah damn hard to find oh yeah um lastly lastly we kind of touched on this at the top but hasbro announced that there would be 1100 layoffs across the company uh, i just have the list of the names here we saw we announced these uh previously as well as we did a tiktok talking about this when it when it was announced yeah um, we were are if, if you want to hear what we have to say then we have the podcast and we don't promote it a whole lot we're actually going to be changing we're going to promote it quite a bit more probably and if you want to hear what we have to say the podcast is a way to do it so we've just kind of not ever done like a here's what we have to say about x subject on our tiktok ever but like this is fucked up yeah because, uh, well, for one, laying off layoffs right before Christmas suck and are not fun. They're sometimes necessary. Understandable. You probably could have done the timing a little bit better. But everyone's like, oh, this is a Watsy problem. They're ruining everything. It's like, no, Hasbro is fucking all the shit up. Yeah. And this and this anonymous interview with a former employee at Watsy that we just went over at the top of the show is proof of that. Is proof that. The people at the top don't know what they're doing. Cynthia Williams doesn't know what she's doing as the as the head of WotC. Mm-hmm. Clearly, she's like, "Oh, our numbers are down." Like, no, their numbers are up. Oh, well, they're not up enough. And it's like, what? Yeah. Oh, we're we're killing it. No, you're not. Like, uh, WotC is propping up the entirety of Hasbro, and even Chris Cox admits that the toy division, all the stuff that isn't Wizards of the Coast, is what's dragging down the company. Yeah. And, of course, like, one of the biggest sectors that got laid off was their Rhode Island office, which was a whole lot of toy stuff. But then they lost so – they laid off so much amazing talent – from Wizards of the Coast, some people that were formerly from Cobalt Press, some people that had just worked on, that had been working on Vecna, Eve of Evil. Um, the biggest one that made the least amount of sense was the director of Magic Universe's Beyond Creative and Production Teams, Megan Galbraith Donahue. She she fucking created Tales of Middle Earth, the most profitable product that Wizards released this year and probably ever. Yeah. She got laid off. So did Mike Merles, one of the most known names at, ha- at Wizards for ga- director of game design for D&D. Yeah, and like some people find him controversial, which I think is a little whatever, but like he's the reason that 5e was he's one of the major reasons 5e was successful. Mm-hmm. Not the, but one of. One of, sure. Like he's one he's the dude that came up with shit like fucking advantage and disadvantage. He came up with like like mechanic staples in tabletop RPGs across the industry. Yeah. And you're laying that guy off from the, from the, the part of Hasbro that makes money. Yeah. That, that supports the parts that don't make money. And we can only assume that obviously, as we saw in the the interview earlier, things are tight there already. You have, you have small, you're short staffed with small teams and now you're laying off a bunch of people who are in senior positions, which means that, the people who are on the teams doing work are now probably going to get promoted to do promoted to do those positions, but they're still going to have to be doing the work. Mm-hmm. Working managers, we're going. It's going to be, it's going to be evident probably in the products we see during twenty twenty four. Yeah, and a lot of work has been done for exciting things like one D and D. Um. I'm now very worried about the Fallout decks. I'm worried about Final Fantasy. I'm worried about Marvel. Like, mm. I'm, all the universes beyond stuff I'm worried about. I'm worried about 
the future products that are after one D and D. Yeah. Like I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm worried that these games that we really love are going to are going to be shelved. That the that Hasbro is going to end up bankrupt, mm-hmm. and Wizards is going to fall with them. Yeah. And in the fire sale to cover their debts, Magic is going to end up in the hands of fucking Disney, and D and D is going to end up in the hands of like fucking Amazon, and. I, I'm just throwing out random companies. I don't actually think though, but like, I mean, there's a poss- there's all there's always the chance, um, and then they just go away, we, and then then we need to pivot. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this a while ago. That in 2022, um, there was we talked about a a wizard sent a cease and desist to some people who were trying to do um, NFTs of magic cards to create a new online magic nft economy uh using using and and one of their propositions to doing this was oh we want to help build the community but also get to the community to a point where someday we may be able to buy magic the gathering from wizards of the coast and we were back then we were like that is ridiculous that is silly and now we're like maybe somebody maybe some nice post malone will buy magic the gathering I feel like Post wouldn't let Magic go away. I could totally see that. But, like... Walks in, punches Cynthia. Will she let, Will she kill Watsy in the face and walks out with Magic the Gathering? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. The idea... Yeah, I love I love the visual of Post Malone assaulting a woman. That's great. Okay. That's a, uh, great, that's a great visual that you just brought up. That was good. <laughs> she, she's representative of, of the issues. So, you know... Yeah. It's 20, um, 24 now. Wow. Yeah. Alt Fox was right. They were right. Just saying. Um, all right. Well, at this point, we would normally go to the TikTok live chat. I've been kind of monitoring it a little bit. This is kind of a role reversal here a little bit yeah. today. Uh, there's been there's been some conversations. We brought up some stuff as stuff was coming up. Um, but I think I think we I think we are go- we should just talk about what we want for. For the community and maybe for us going forward a little bit and then just just call it a day because it's already we're already at nearly two hours yeah. so D and I think one D is going to be in a good spot um by getting digital versions of the books when you buy physical versions of the books is good i'm excited for one dnd i'm excited to get back into tabletop rpgs a little bit this year uh, Magic, the sets that are coming out this year, I'm not super jazzed about. I think Ravnica Remastered is going to be great. Uh, we'll see. We'll see about the rest as they come. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think of the the products with D and D? I it's, it's one thing we've said before. You can play Fifth Edition for years and years to come without ever buying a new product. Mm-hmm. And as long as what's what's left of the development cycle of one D continues as smoothly as we've seen over the past several months um as long as that continues well i think we'll be good but if it doesn't we'll be still playing D real fifth edition 2014 fifth edition mm-hmm. for years to come uh as far as magic goes i think there's a lot of cool things coming in uh magic I hope i i have some thoughts on designs that i uh, you know we hope to see over the next over the coming year but mostly I just hope to, that we don't continuously get product fatigue. No, we will. We will. We will. <laughs> but they're going to set a new record for secret layers, I bet. Secret layer releases. But uh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say Ju in the GU, JU in the um in the TikTok live chat. Just call it 6th edition for God's sake. Uh, we were saying that we for 5. a long time. 5.5 because it's a 5th edition refresh. Just call it 5.5, it, 5, call it 6th, whatever. Since they're just move selling on. us new books, they they shouldn't be calling it the same thing. Call it D&D. Get rid of editions entirely. Be like if you want to make it a platform, which is what they want, just make it Dungeons and Dragons. Period. Or they can make it D&D, Dragons and Dungeons. Perfect. 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 Amazing. Uh, last thing. Last thing. For the Dungeon Bros going forward. Yeah. 2023, I think, was the year of the live stream and the podcast. Yes. Uh, yeah. The podcast, I think, is in a good spot right now. I like I like what we're doing. Uh, we have ideas for improving it. Yeah. And, and we'll get and we'll be doing that. Uh, we've kind of we've kind of 
drop the ball a little bit on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. And we've got some new initiatives that uh, we're very excited for. Um, yeah, yeah. Look for look forward to some YouTube videos. Look forward to some podcast clips. Yeah. Uh, look forward to the continuation and uh, the subtle improvements for the Monday Night Magic live streams, which is kind of kind of very fun. And look forward to us just kind of trying to play around with it a bit more. Yeah. Just just get ener- get energized again because I think we've both just experienced. I think a lot of people have experienced a very depressive year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um... Can't wait for the entire economy of the world to crash in 2024 because it's been propped up for like three years. But beyond that, fuck it, we'll be, we'll, we'll be we might be able to afford a fucking mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, yeah. You got anything? No. Okay. Let's uh, let's wrap this. Okay. Well, as I like to always end my game nights with, Sam, let's hold hands and hopscotch out of this godforsaken, awful, terrible year. That's all. Yep. That's, 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 that's it. That's it. I, I was going to do a bit, but that well, is the bit. That is the bit. Well, thankfully, it is now done with 2023. See you in 2024.